Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. My name is JJ, and um, I've been working all week to share something with you all. Hey, can we give a big hand to Ted for the message he brought last week? Yeah, that was good. And um, Ted's not here today, but I saw Carolyn here, so um, she can say, babe, they gave you a high five with, with applause this morning. But uh, I listened this week and watched the, the last week's message, and wow, it was so good. I'm honored that there are people that uh, just that he would share what he went through just uh, in life and then everything with his brother and then come and just share with us because um, could anybody else relate to some of the stuff he was talking about? Because I know I could. Um, would you guys bow your heads? and bow your hearts. Actually, you don't have to bow your heads. I don't know why I said that. You can look up, you can look down, you can keep your eyes open if you want. But would you bow your hearts with me in prayer as we ask God to bless the communication of his word. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for that, <clears throat> those worship songs. Those were prayed over and selected and practiced and then sung with the belief that they would land right where they needed to, and they did. And um, Lord, as I was thinking about that song, You're All I Want, I couldn't help but in my heart say, um, help me believe that. Because I get, I get uh, tossed around in my mind of all so many different things that I want. But at the end of the day, Lord, I want to know you more. I want the people in this room to really know you for who you are. I want the people in our city, we as a church family, we want the people in our city to know you, Jesus. To not know a version of you that somebody told them that doesn't hit the nail on the head, but we want people to know you for who you are. So would you speak to us through your word, because it's yours. We open up our hearts, we open up this church, and uh, we ask for you to have your way, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So Caitlin said we're starting a new series. I've been kind of looking at it like many series is, okay? We've been talking about rhythms, Jesus' rhythms. Was anybody blessed by any of the Jesus rhythms we talked about? Okay. Some of us. Good. If you were blessed by the Jesus rhythms, give, me, give Jesus a hand. How about that? All right, that was very Bellingham of us. We sort of clapped. But for the last few weeks, we've been looking at some of Jesus' rhythms. The next step in this process is we are going to look into a new series, which is what I'm calling, what we're going to call, The First of Us. Because remember, Jesus had disciples. He had students. He had apprentices, the ones who responded to this invitation, the things that we talked about. Jesus saw people. Jesus took risks on people. Jesus changed people. These are the people that we're going to look, and now we're going to follow the story into their lives. These are the ones that left their way of life to be yoked up to Jesus like he was talking about and to learn from him and to live like him. The story of the book of Acts is a continuation of the story that, of Jesus' life that we read about in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of Acts is a continuation of God accomplishing his work on earth, but not just through his son Jesus, but by his Holy Spirit through people. One commentator says this, the Gospels tell the story of Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection. The epistles, anybody know what that is? It's the letters that we read um, later in Scripture. The epistles are letters written to various first century churches and individuals. And the book of Acts is a 30-year period that plays a pivotal role as a linchpin between, between these two elements, between Jesus' life, and then these letters that you read later on in the church, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, pick any of your Eans, and it's one of those. 
But without the book of Acts, you would turn to one of these and you'd be like, who's Paul? Who's that dude? Who's the church in Corinth? What's the church, you would say, without the book of Acts? It is, in essence, the chronicle of the first of us. The people who first, who God first worked through. So we're going to be looking at their natural responses and rhythms as God called them and empowered them to be his witnesses. What's that noise? Is that me? Do you guys hear that? Am I tripping? We're going to be looking at their natural responses and rhythms as God called and empowered them to be witnesses in their time and to become what we now know as the church. You guys down for this? All right, so the first one we're going to look at today is the rhythm, the, the first rhythm we want to consider, and the title of today's message is this. The early church was full of it. The early church was full of it. So if you have your Bible, open up to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, let me read to us the first 11 verses. little background on Acts. Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And Acts is the sequel. It's the, it's the second movie of the, of the bunch, because he says this, starting in verse 1. In my former book, so he wrote, look, or he wrote Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, this is the person he was writing to, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Verse 9, after, the, after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them, hid him, from their sight. That would have been crazy. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going. I imagine like when you try to follow the balloon, when the kid lets it go, and you're like, look, we still see it. And then you're staring. They were doing that. But it was Jesus and not a balloon. As he was, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The theme verse of any portion of scripture, there's a theme, there's a point. The point to the book of Acts, I read it, it's chapter 1, Verse 8. This is the theme verse. So as you read Acts, you pour all of, everything that you read, this will be your, your funnel. You pour it through, and it funnels through verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Now he's talking to them, so he said to them, in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of of the earth. The book of Acts is more about God's promises than people's performance. We call it the Acts of the Apostles, but you could really easily say is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. After Jesus did what he did, 
He said, don't go anywhere, but wait for the presence of God and the power that, of the Holy Spirit, and then he is going to do the work through you guys. This is the next phase. This is the church age. He gives them the promise of, well, if you read John, the Holy Spirit has many names or many things that he does. The comforter. He's the one who helps us when, when we don't even know what to pray because we hurt so bad and all we can muster up is a... The Bible says the Holy Spirit is praying through you. He's our helper when we don't have the strength to do and he gives us strength to do what we do. The advocate, the one who's constantly advocating on our behalf. He's our guide, helps us to navigate life, but we want to focus on this. He is a power source. Let's look at this uh, promise of one that would help and that would give us power. Skip over to chapter 2. So we have, don't go anywhere, the promise, and then Jesus goes, and then it says this in chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Pentecost, 50. It says that in those first verses, Jesus was alive and doing stuff for how many days? Did anybody catch it? 40. And now we're 50 days later. How many days were the disciples without Jesus and before the, Holy, before the day of Pentecost? Say it proudly. Good job. <laughs> 10 days. It happened 50 days after the Passover where Jesus was crucified. During the Passover. Good Friday. Coming up in a couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about it. That was the day on a Friday that Jesus hung on the cross. Did you know that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, the smoke from the temple would have been rising in the background from where the, the Passover, from where the lambs were being sacrificed? So it was the, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world along with the lambs that were being uh, offered for Passover. But 50 days after that, uh, if you read about it in Leviticus, you can read about it in Exodus, uh, actually three places, book of Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers is talked about, actually in Deuteronomy it talks about it some too, it talks about these feasts that God set for the nation of Israel. There were three main ones, and Pentecost was a feast in the Old Testament, it was the harvest party. It was the most widely um, attended party because there was the, the Feast of First Fruits. So like when you first start to see the first little things come out of the ground, they would take a little bit of it, they would take some grain, and they would offer up some grain. But on the Pentecost party, they had whole loaves of bread. So it was like the harvest party. It was the best food, the best wine, the weather was good. So Jerusalem always was packed during this time. It's important to know that it was the most packed the city would be throughout the year. Because when God does something, he does it with a purpose. 50 days ago from now, I was just thinking about 50 days. Do you still remember what happened 50 days ago? Um, 50 days ago, Ollie got third in the bank slalom. That's a big deal in our house. We've been trying to get third in the stinking bank slalom for a long time. And we're going to keep trying to get to do well in it. But 50 days ago, I was looking on my phone. I have a picture of Ollie. I don't think we have a slide for it. I forgot to send it to the guys. Oh, we do. 50 days ago, this was this. I remember it as if it was yesterday. We were so happy, so proud, but I'm just like, dang, I can't believe that was already 50. That's how fresh it is in my mind. When these people are here doing this thing, you can take it down. We don't want to distract a crowd with how good looking that kid is. <laughs> this was how fresh it was in their mind. In the Old Testament, 
Did you know this? The day of Pentecost was the day that Israel received the law on the tablets of stone. That was the day they received that, after they left Egypt. Um, in the New Testament, the Pentecost is not the day of Pentecost is not where we receive tablets of stone, but it's the fulfillment of the prophecy that God would write his law on our hearts. No longer on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. It's not where we get a law to follow, but where God implants his very nature in our own lives. I say it like this. It's where the Holy Spirit tattooed the law of God on our hearts. It was no longer something that we are to follow but that would flow from our very lives. So when the Spirit of God arrived on this day, he filled the people with, this is what I want to talk about, the power of God's presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, fills us with new identity, new ability, and new opportunity. Let's read these verses in chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. That's important. I have that verse underlined in my Bible. From every nation under heaven. This was the, the most amount of people from the most different places were there this day. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? What was chapter 1, verse 8? You will be my witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. New identity. This is what I love. Who will be my witnesses? You. Who was in this place? Well, it tells us that there's about 120 people in this place. Men, women. Is the Holy Spirit pick and choose who he fills? No, he's down to fill anybody who wants to be filled. Who was in this room? People who Jesus saw potential in despite their shortcomings. I love Melinda's prayer this morning because it's my prayer too. It's just this sense of like, God, I love you. I want to follow you in my life. I want to make you proud. I want to be thinking and be mindful of the kingdom of God when I'm at work or at school and all the stuff at home, all the things that I have going, but I need help. It's just very, just very real. But these are the type of people that Jesus filled. He was like, yeah, you. People who had decided to follow him and be taught by him and be changed by him. And I love what the crowd says. How is this possible? Look at who these people are. I know I've said this before. I promise I'll say it a million times again because we always want to be reminded. I think the most diverse people in our city collected under one roof should be at church. I think the more people that we have from different walks of life and different backgrounds and different struggles and different everything, then we can learn to not focus on our differences but focus on our commonalities. Let me tell you some commonalities. Jesus wants to fill all of you with his spirit. He wants you to go, yes, you. Even if someone goes, yeah, but isn't that person this, that, or the other? Was that person in jail? Yep. Look at what God chooses to do. Then you know what happens? We start to make a real big deal about God's grace because it's God's grace that picks people 
no matter what they've been through, and says, I will put my spirit in you. I will give you new identity. But we forget. Normal people, men and women, this is what I see about these people that, that uh, made them perfect candidates for the power and new identity being filled by the spirit. They were open to God. It says they were together in one place, just being like, God, if you want to do something, we're in. You told us to wait. When we're open to God, that helps us to be like, oh, I need to pray more. Praying is good, but there's a heart set and a life set that, God, I'm open to you. What do you want to do? They were open to God. They were available to be used. There was space to be filled. That can be convicting. Is there space in your life? Are you full? What are you full of? Full of it. Are you available to be used? And they were willing. He says, you are going to be my what? He didn't say, you guys are going to sit here in this huddle forever. Not that it's bad. It was so good. It's the space that they were filled. But he says, you have, you're going to go. There's always a go involved. They were willing to do it. So no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, what you've done, if there is space in your life, if there is openness to God and a willingness to follow him, he will fill you with his spirit and purposes. Can I get an amen? amen? Some of you just don't know who you are to God. I think the biggest thing in the world about why do people not follow Jesus, number one, they don't know that he's actually real and that he's good, but they don't know who they are to him. Some of my best friends that I've talked to as life goes on, it, it turns from, ah, I don't want God, and it turns to this. Why would he ever want me if they're honest? They don't understand grace. We are Jesus' people, and we sometimes don't understand grace because we think he looks and he picks the good stuff in us, and he's like, do more of the good stuff, do more of the bad, and then you'll be usable. He says, no, are you open? Are you available? Are you willing? I want to fill you. If you have placed your life in God's hands, let me tell you who you are. You are God's sons, and you are God's daughters. You want to know how serious God is about this? It says this in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen people. Some of you need to hear this today. If you have laid your life down at Jesus' feet, sin and all, that's what it is to become a Christian. I say you come to Jesus, warts and all, and you're like, here I am, Lord. If you would take me, take me. If you would fill me, fill me. If you see potential in me, I don't see it in myself, but if you do, I lay down my way for your way. You have done that. This is what the scripture says about you. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. God's special possession, not a nation like a country, a nation like a people group. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Some of you guys need to remember who you are. You need to hear more of the voice of God saying you are mine than the voice of the world telling you what you need to do, what you need to be, who you're not. You need to be reminded. If you haven't placed your life into the Lord's hands, traded your way for his way, asked him to fill you and lead you, then you're a foreigner to God and to the things of God. But let me tell you God's heart. God doesn't want foreigners. He just wants family. He doesn't want people operating on their own things. He wants people to know him. And I want people to know him. And I hope you want people to know him. Because this is what it says in John chapter 1, very first chapter of John, verse 12. Yet all who did receive him, all who believed in his name, he gave them new identity because he gave them the right to become children of God, not born of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born 
of God. When the Spirit of God pours out on a place or on a people, he gives us a new identity. The second one is this. He gives us new ability. When the Spirit fills you, he brings new ability. This is where we see the partnership of wills that we've been talking about. What it is to, um, when Jesus says, take my yoke upon yourself and learn from me. You, you come side by side, and at the longer we walk with Jesus, what we want to do naturally becomes more what he wants to do. That's that partnership of wills. The Spirit took what they were doing on their own, and he gave them power and effectiveness beyond their own ability. What were they doing? They were gathered, they were praising God, praying, and then the Spirit came in a supernatural way. Jonah and I were talking about this the other day. Because it was windy, we were on a mountain bike ride. And it sounded like this. I was thinking about this scripture on Friday. Was it Friday? It was the wind came out of nowhere right before it started dumping rain in the afternoon. And these trees were blowing all over the place. And Jonah's like, What makes the noise of the wind? And I had to think, and I'm like, Oh yeah, okay, it's air passing over the the branches and the friction made by it. But it was violent sounding, and trees were like cracking in the woods and stuff. So I was thinking about this because they were praying and hanging out, doing what they do, and the Spirit of God fell on that place. And it says there was a wind, a violent wind. What's a violent wind? A tornado, a hurricane. Um, It was enough to where the people weren't there, heard it, and came being like, what the heck is going on in this place? And just to let you know, I don't even think it's in my notes, it was a little weird to the community. We're a little weird to the community because they're like, what is happening in this place? Aren't these normal people? How is this that that's happening? But there's something that's happening that was unmistakable. He takes what we do naturally and he works supernaturally through it. This made me think about fame. Fame is a funny thing. Being well known for something you can do It's weird in our culture because our culture, like theirs, is obsessed with being known and famous. And I love what the Holy Spirit does because when God is in something, the people aren't famous. Jesus is famous. The ability I'm talking about this morning is not the ability you have on your own, but the potential that God sees in you. The ability to take what you are doing naturally and have it even speak to someone else. Look, pick it back up in verse 7. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, And the parts of Libya Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. I love this about the Holy Spirit. If you could grab something this morning, maybe this would be it. God loves to take what you do naturally, and I say he likes to breathe fire into it and make it, and make it have an impact on other people's lives. He took what they were doing, made it speak to someone else. It's one of the coolest things. This is the gift of tongues the Bible talks about. But you know what the gift of tongues is? Speaking in an unknown language to you, but known to someone else. Let me tell you common gifts of tongues we overlook. When a grandma or grandpa talks to their grandson in their own language, but the kid gets it. They don't have to use the hip terms. They can call a song a good song and not a bop. They can call, they can use their words and God can flow through it. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? You can be a certain place at a company, working there from a certain background, and you can just be you. 
but you can be the Holy Spirit filled version of you that when you talk, God has a way of speaking through you that someone can be like, yeah, they're different, but what does this mean? I love that about church because just to let you know, the world, we are a curious people. And I'm totally cool with it. We spend a lot of time sometimes hiding who we are to the world because we want to be cool. But the Lord is kind of saying, you're pretty cool. I'm doing something through you that's going to speak to other people's languages. And there's such a freedom in this because it doesn't, it doesn't, um, we don't ever have to arrive at a place where God will use us. He just says, are you open? Are you available? Are you willing? He'll give you ability. That's how you can look at someone on a stage who didn't take any classes or do any certain thing, and you, and you can be like, God asked them to do it. It's Peter and John did it. They were like, aren't these guys nobodies? They must have been with Jesus. That's what God wants for your life. That's pretty rad. Okay, the last one is this, opportunity. When the Spirit fills you, he brings new opportunity. What is the point of this day? Because they were like, wow, look at these people. They're speaking all these tongues. What does this mean? Keep reading in Acts when you go home. <laughs> or this week. You don't have to go home straight home and be like, Bible study will continue. You can eat first. Um, there's a response. Peter teaches. There's a great response. He's like, I'll tell you what this means. And he gives a, a message and, and it's just, it's a beautiful message. 3,000 people respond in one day. But it started here with normal men and women gathering, praying, seeking the Lord. When the Spirit fills you, he brings new opportunity. But we're like, what is going on here? What is the point of this passage? It may not be clear to us, but the, the, word he, or the work here to me is very, very obvious. It was to reach people that weren't in that room. When the Spirit fills a place, he fills it with opportunity. It was to have this one nation under heaven, regardless of background, geographical location. If you look at this map, um, you can pull it up online or, or look in the back of your, of your Bible. Some of them have maps, and you look and just start looking for some of these places. It's as big as the map was at the time. So we're talking little Jerusalem, this tiny little thing in the middle, and then it's talking about areas in Babylon, down in Africa, Rome. It was as big as the known world was. Everybody was there for this, at least um, a number of people from different geographical locations, and God met them all where they were at in this place through normal people. It wasn't their goal. You guys know that? What was their goal? To get together, be together, have community, pray together, encourage each other. But God's spirit fell on this place, and then he is like, no, this is an outworking. It doesn't stay here. It goes. It actually made sense of what he told them before he went to heaven in Matthew 28, where we get the Great Commission from. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, to, commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How is he with them? He went to heaven. He says, I'm going, but it's good that I go. For if I go, I will send the promise of my Father who will give you power to be my witnesses. So we're not just the weird Christian at work. We're the spirit-filled and empowered coworker or fellow student or whatever we're doing that God is, the Bible says, a vessel. Broken vessel for sure, but a vessel nonetheless. From this day forward, right here, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, the goal of the early church, the first of us, when they were in sync with the Spirit, the goal was to move in an outward direction 
sharing this love and filling with as many people as they could. God gave them new identity, new ability, new opportunity. So this morning, just a few closing thoughts. The church throughout history has had these verses. They, God didn't open them up to us for just special for the bridge today. God's word that I love so much. These verses have been here for us to look at for a long time. And church throughout history has looked at these and desired to experience what they experience. Experience the power and the wonder described here. I've actually heard it said, if we could just get back to Pentecost. I just feel like the Lord wanted me to encourage you and say, Pentecost, it's not a place to go back to. Pentecost is present when people are together, when people are open, available, and willing to be filled by the Spirit to do what God says, to receive the Spirit. You know, I think a lot of what I'm hearing, and even wrestling with in my own life at times, I feel like I'm pretty good with it, but I hear a lot of, if we could just, especially when it comes to church stuff, oh, if we could just get back to pre-COVID, as if everything in the church was great pre-COVID. Maybe people were just unwilling to like put it out there how they were doing. Maybe they were faking it for a while and just were been over it forever. Maybe it just did what it naturally did and exposed stuff that was already going. It was like the, the kicker when you order concrete and it's real wet and you get them to throw a little calcium that sets faster. I don't know, that just came to me. That's my construction background. <clears throat> no big deal. Um, I actually don't know if any of that's true. I think I just made it up. <laughs> but that's kind of like what COVID did. It, it, it exposed stuff, but I've, you know, pre-COVID church, we had like, not we, but there was uh, more people around. Churches were like doing better, and everyone's like, oh, it's because they did this during COVID. They lost all their people. They did this. They did that. Everyone wants to put the stuff. I'm like, man, I, you guys, just to let you know, I don't buy in any of that stuff. Um, you know why? Because Pentecost is a people group, not a place. And God can pour out his spirit in this place right now. And we can do things just naturally that God will breathe fire and life into that will make a difference in the world. Like, I actually believe that. And so we keep going forward. And we keep opening the doors every Sunday. And if someone wants to come in, it doesn't matter where you slept last night, you come. If you're, if you're here and you're curious about who Jesus is and what it looks like to be part of this peculiar people group called a Christian, then come in. If you have a different agendas, we'll talk about that because we're, we're here to be together. But it's always going to be like that. And it's always going to be like this. You know this? We'll have to get into the rhythms. One of them, it was messy. Yeah. The rhythms that we'll look at in the coming weeks are a natural outworking of the filling of the Spirit. They weren't just a people that had dinner together a lot. Mm -mm. They were a people that had new identity, new ability, and new opportunity. So when they saw people, they saw people worth investing in, not worth, worth avoiding. So what they saw people worth giving to, not shunning. The Spirit of God was moving in them, so they became a giving people. They became a praying people. They became a gathering people. They became all of these things because of the filling. I want you to know the Spirit of God knows your name. He works in you every day to accomplish God's purposes, not just like in their time, but in our time. I want to be a church, just to let you know, that's full of it, but full of, not full of ourselves. I want to be a people that's full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Hey, could we stand and pray as the worship team comes up and we'll finish our time with this song? Father, we thank you for today and for this morning. Thank you for your word. And thank you, Lord, for these radical promises. That you don't just leave us how we are, but you actually fill us. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room right now that thinks worse of themselves than they should, I pray as we're singing the song, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to them and let them know who they are to you. And I guess I'll just keep it real and, and pray the, the opposite of that prayer too. If there's anyone that's in this place that thinks that they just got it all together and they don't really need you because they're full of themselves, Lord, I pray you'd break their heart just a little bit that they would know that the same things, that you love them. It's not because of how much they bring to the table, but because of what Jesus brought to the cross on our behalf. Lord, we want to be right in that radical middle place where we know who we are in you, and yet we need you every single day. Lord, we sing the song to you in response. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.